Uh, all right, we are officially recording. We are on our, I can't do the math, I, another <laughs> conversations with designers. Um, and this one, everybody, is with Rachel Boyo. And let's see, her, her official, official title. She is a photographer, filmmaker, and educator. Uh, obviously based in Northeast Arkansas. We're gonna find out more information from you. Um, and she, uh, I have her here on Conversations with Designers that is going out to the YouTube channel when this is done. Uh, because she is a really, my gosh, the amount of work you have, practicing photographer, which that Venn diagram of designers is gonna overlap. Um, she also happens to be one of our, our new professor at A-State. So that's a little fun thing for us, but <laughs> anyway. Hi, Rachel. Fun for me too. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, thank you for being here today. So glad to be here. And it is odd that we're on Zoom since we often see each other in the halls, but right now we are in completely different states. So there we go. <laughs> uh, so let's see, let's go through here. And by the way, anybody who is here in the Zoom room, you have to keep your cameras off, but you can always chat me up in the, uh, well, in the chat. Um, it is chat to everyone. And even if we don't get to your question right away, we will at the end. And also towards the end, I got to set my timer. Um, towards the end, I will stop the record and everyone can turn off their cameras and ask questions in person. Or you can ask questions with your camera off too. But let me start that stopwatch because I know better. We'll just keep talking. All right. So first of all, You've done a lot of work here in the Delta region. We're going to get to that and just all over the South uh, Eastern United States. But you did your, your BA and your BFA up there in those Eastern regions. Yeah. North Tell me about that. Well, so I'm originally from New York and <laughs> I'm originally, I grew up in New York and also spent some time abroad as a kid too. Um, we lived in Singapore for a few years. But mostly in New York is Singapore. Oh, that's right. And I, I knew that, but to everybody here, yeah. wow. That was when I was much younger. Like we moved there when I was eight and, you know, I was back for middle school. But yeah, I, I grew up in New York and I think the Northeast always like, I don't know. I think my upbringing was very, within America, like very Northeast centric. And for me, you know, when I was thinking about schools, I like Tufts really appealed to me. And I actually, I did not enroll at the museum school initially. I just went to Tufts. I was already obsessed with photography. It was my favorite thing in life and what I spent all my waking hours doing, but I was too scared to go to art school. So I went to Tufts and I was like really into international relations, peace and justice studies, like just doing the liberal arts thing and taking photography classes for fun. By the way, guys, Tufts is in Massachusetts. Yes, so, I was yes. so in Boston area. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I was taking photo classes and after my first year, my photography professor basically like staged an intervention with me where he was like, you need to get a degree in this because this is insane. Because I was like overnight in the dark room several nights a week, not getting much sleep and spending a crazy amount of time making photographs. And he was like, what, what's, what's the deal with this? Like, why aren't you just going for it? This is what you do. Um, and also, by the way, not only is it photography, but you just said you were pretty much making art all hours of the night, not getting much sleep. Well, that's an art student. Perfect. Yes. Yeah. All I right. was basically already living the art student lifestyle without being enrolled in art school. But it ended up being perfect because Tufts has a dual degree program with the Museum of Fine Arts. So I still like for me that felt comfortable, like as a way of like sticking, you know, putting a toe in the water and, yeah. you know, going to art school, but also getting like a BA that felt like my safety net, even though I just went with photography and I've never looked back. And then I actually lived in Boston for two years after undergrad working there. So I spent seven years in Boston. Wow, do you ever miss it? I mean- No, miss it's really cold. <laughs> I, I love the people there. It's a really great intellectual hub. There's a lot going on with like so many schools in town, but I did my time there. I, I dealt with the snow. Um, you ever miss I a good lobster roll though? 
the the seafood's pretty amazing. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. Is lobster roll like only tourist food that I've had when I've been there? Is that only for tourists? Or is no, it really a thing? Good. Lobster's always good. <laughs> I, I didn't really enjoy it when I was an art student, but after right. I graduated and had a job, that's you had I ramen when you were an art student. <laughs> yeah, all my money was film and printing paper, and yeah. yeah. So when did you know you wanted to be a photographer? Oh gosh, I mean, I guess it was probably like after my photography professor took me aside and talked to me. Really, like that conversation was kind of a game changer for me yeah. that you know I, mean, I was like sleep deprived at the moment he I was literally like curled up in a ball sleeping on this really nasty old orange armchair while my prints were in the wash and I had just fallen asleep and he was working on a book he was publishing so he came in at like 6 30 in the morning and I just wasn't anticipating anyone there so I was just sleeping and he would walk with a cane and he just tapped me with his cane like <laughs> and called me into his office and that makes me I, I just feel like like Gandalf like Lord of the Rings he, like, like, he just, <laughs> oh my gosh he's such a character <laughs> but he basically asked me like why I wasn't going for it and I told him I was afraid that it would be fundamentally selfish um for me to just spend my life doing what I love like how would I be giving back like what does that look like how do you actually make a living um and he basically told me that for him, like his, for him teaching has been that, a way of sharing what he loves with others in a way that feels like it's not just about him and his work and a way of like inspiring the next generation. And I kind of thought about it and I was like, oh yeah. So if I could have the impact on someone that you just had on me, that kind of could make it all worth. So for me, I decided that I wanted to teach at the moment I decided I wanted to be a photographer. So at the very same time, wow. Yes, that, that was like my enrolling in art school was contingent on like long-term, I want to be a photography professor. I, I dabbled with photojournalism for a little bit and yeah, I- Yeah, we're going to talk really about that. that. Okay. <laughs> no, but you can oh, keep going. Oh. I didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> no, but I just, for me, like teaching and my practice- have kind of been intertwined ever since because I started being a TA for him the next semester. Mm -hmm. um, and I like for me, like interacting and sharing what I'm working on while like helping students with what they're working on, like that it's just all been hand in hand for me. Yeah. And I and I assume that after you decided you wanted to be a professor, that was one of the many other reasons why you went on to get an MFA because you probably yes. learned in order to profess one must have the terminal degree yes exactly and I also wanted like more time to focus on my work mm -hmm. um because my undergrad was really intense going to the two schools simultaneously yeah. like when I say sleep deprived like an average of like three or four overnight like all nighters a week like it was it was kind of crazy but that was what it took to make my work. Like I was in school all day and evening. And when I got out of class at nine or 10, that was my time to actually do my homework and make my work. Right. But so I, I wanted more of an opportunity to just focus on my photography yeah. since I hadn't had that undergrad because I had been so nervous about going to art school. Right, right. By the way, in the chat, I'm going to, even though I've, so hang on a little bit even though I put it in the Slack just for people to check out your information and all that stuff is, I just okay. put it in the, oops, that's in the waiting room. Let me try that again to everyone. Well, hopefully everybody saw that, I hope. I see a, two questions in the chat. Do you want me to answer those later? Yeah, I don't know why I'm not seeing, oh, there we go. Um, uh, Actually, we can skip right on to the Chloe's questions about equipment because I have that on my list. Um, by the way, did you guys just get the rachelboyo.com? Can you just give me a yes or no in the chat if you got? No, okay. Um, you just type it in. Yeah, and I just don't know why I'm not able to. Oh, the technology. Yeah, you type it in. Sorry, yeah, that's what I mean. You type it in, please. <laughs> okay, cool. So actually, um, we are, that is kind of a, 
on our conversation, but um, we there is a question on equipment. So, which leads me to, while we're asking about equipment. <laughs> Sorry, I just saw a pose. <laughs> oh no, dropping the camera off your car. It's true. The what camera happened? still works. Okay, tell me, because I don't know. What? Um, I was on a shoot in Kentucky and I was uh, like making pictures off the top of my Jeep. And I was using multiple cameras and one of them fell on the way down. It still works great. I love that camera. It's a workhorse. I've lent it out to students in the past. I use it for my work. That thing cannot fail. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of, what kind it's of a Pentax 6-7. It? It's fantastic. And Chloe, to circle back to your questions, I'm primarily actually a film photographer. I do use both. But for my personal artwork, I actually still really prefer film. I usually shoot color, although on my current project, I'm actually mixing color in black and white right now. I think it's gonna work, but we'll see. Um, but I shoot large form, mostly like large and medium format color film. I, I just, I really love the process. In terms of Canon or Nikon, I don't think it matters. I really don't. Now, I you, think you, people, did, you did put out an old school term though that even I know, Pentax. So yeah, are, are, those, yeah. are those still around? So the Pentax 6.7 is the one I dropped off the Jeep. It still has a dent. It is very much, they're around, but like that one I had bought off of eBay. It's not a super expensive camera, but that's the thing about film cameras. Like they're not that expensive these days because you buy them used, but you do have to pay for the film. Gotcha. So a lot of people actually, like when they see me with my large format, they assume it's like, whoa, super expensive. It's actually like comparable to your run of the mill digital SLR. It's just, you don't see it as much these days. But in terms of Canon Nikon, again, I really don't think it matters. Um, I honestly think it, what matters is what you do with it. I really like, I think some of the technical stuff, there are people that will argue until the ends of the earth over that. And I really think the differences are imperceptible. And mm -hmm. all that matters is finding a camera that feels like an extension of you. For me, that is Canon, but that's because that's what I used first. I got yep. used to it and I'm more familiar with knowing what's where without thinking. Yep. At the end of the day, it's about finding a system that works for you. The technical stuff is a means to an end in terms of like communicating ideas, you know, sharing your vision. So I think you know, it is important to think through the technical stuff, but I wouldn't belabor it to the point where it like paralyzes you because at the end of the day, what matters most is what you do with it. Mm -hmm. By the way, since we are talking to people who probably are aware of this, how much, or maybe it's just me transferring my own issues, uh, how much is Photoshop a crutch? Do you think that photographers shouldn't use Photoshop? Should they not? There are no wrong answers. Oh, I'm, no, I'm, I use Photoshop a lot. I could not feel so much better. Yeah, I don't think I could. I, I would struggle to make my work right now without Photoshop, just because mm -hmm. when you scan negatives, there's a lot of work to be done. It's very different than when you just pop them in an enlarger. There's a lot more interpretation involved. So I think Photoshop is important, but I do try and like limit especially with students, like how much they do early on, because I do think when you're learning, it can be a crutch if you were trying to do too much in Photoshop, because then you don't do as much of the work in camera when you're shooting. Yeah. And there's only so much you can make up later. There is a lot you can do, but if you're relying on that, you're going to miss a lot of good pictures, especially like something like cropping. I don't really encourage it early on because you're going to make that much better images if you're really thinking about nailing the composition when you're shooting. Yes, that was, see, that's what I, I was wondering. Is there a matter of, do you, are you more of a shoot the whole thing and crop it later or crop it while you're, while you're shooting? I think you just answered that, but which one was that? I think were... it totally, I mean, I do think it varies. So like for students, when they're starting out, I, I don't want them to crop a ton just because that, like if they're thinking about, drastically altering the composition when it's on a computer screen, like that can become a crutch, right? So I think, you know, you have to do your best when you're at the shoot, you know, to get the composition you want. But there are definitely times 
when there's no more room or you're like at an awkward angle and you do need to change some things later. And that's totally fine. I just don't encourage students to rely on it too much early on mm -hmm. because if that's like what you're relying on, I just think sometimes you don't push yourself as much when you're shooting and you always have to push yourself in the moment. That's why I actually don't encourage looking at screens that much with digital cameras. You're going to waste your battery. True. The pictures can be misleading because they look different on a computer screen. Yeah. And, you know, you're missing everything else that's happening around you while you're looking at that screen. It's as distracting as like constantly texting or something. I mean, I think it's checking the screen to make sure things are coming out. You know, that's something that's really nice to have for my students that just shot film for the first time. It can be very anxiety provoking. Oh, yeah and not knowing if anything is showing up and it might not, right? right? But I think the screen in digital photography can be a crutch because it just like feeds our need for instant gratification. And then you start obsessing and editing while you're there rather than like making more pictures of, you know, the person in front of you or something. Right. Like that. And what I love about everything you just said is that, um, you're talking about as students are learning how to photograph and then they can choose like I, I assume that especially since we have our world is you can shoot anything with smartphone now so um I guess my my thing is is that you're even if perhaps like other other photographers end up going crazy with photoshop and stuff like that you're saying kind of like you need to learn how to write a sentence first before you can compose a story like you've got exactly. to know the basics exactly. Right. Yeah. Or as I tell my students all the time, you got to learn the rules before you can properly break them. Exactly. So. I'm actually a really big believer in that too. Go us. See. So, oh my gosh, I have so many other. Okay. So by the way, along that line, and this might be too big of a, of a thing to open up, but how would you talk about art photography? You know that that's a big old heavy label. Yeah commercial photography and photojournalism. Where do all those, big. aside from you're like, I can do it all, what do you want? <laughs> <laughs> no, big, really important question. And I've actually been talking about that a lot, I think in my current photo class, um, but I, I think it's really important. So, and then there's also like documentary, which is like right in between photojournalism and fine art. Right, and that's your, so, that's your specialty, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so photojournalism, you know, it's really about storytelling and particularly with an emphasis on like capturing events in a quick fashion. And that ended up being like why it wasn't for me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the quick turnaround, just I, I didn't feel like, I just wanted more time to mm -hmm. get to know the story before telling it. Yeah. Um, and I, I just felt like, honestly, I, I wasn't a good photojournalist because I just felt like the pictures I made, they ended up being so much like other things I've seen because you have like- It's no a genre. But you have like no time to learn the story. But that's just my own, but that's also just me. Um, but photojournalism is very valuable and important in terms of like, showing us what's happening in the yes. world yeah um, and giving but us by the way I took, I took photojournalism for a half second just so you guys know who are in the room oh my god it was the hardest thing I ever did I was like where's photoshop and that was when photoshop was on floppy disks but still yeah it, it's so, so photojournalism also is where I got like my distrust of the camera screen when I was studying with probably the best photojournalist I ever worked with he disables all screens no looking at the screen. He is really, really big on that. In fact, most of the people in like seven agency are. Um, yeah, but like their thing is if you are here to tell a story and capture what's in front of you, turn that off. That's a distraction. Focus on the real world in front of you because you have 24 hours how to figure out how to capture this. So, but that's photojournalism, right. like storytelling, information, like breaking news and coverage. Documentary is sort of, is very much about visual storytelling as well, but 
often documentary projects, you know, take a much longer period of time yeah. um, and are published in book form rather than necessarily in a newspaper. And for that reason, it can be trickier because you usually have to find your own funding rather than working for a newspaper, but that gives you full creative control if you find the funding and you can take your time with it. Fine art is very much about personal vision and expression. And for me, I consider myself both like a fine art and documentary photographer yeah. in that, you know, my work is very much born of the real world. I try and focus on like social issues that I think are relevant. These mm -hmm. are real human stories, but I do try and bring a really artistic perspective with it to mm -hmm. it. And I, I take liberties, you know, to, you know, I'm shooting large format. Everything when you use a camera like that is somewhat orchestrated. Um, there's nothing spontaneous about it. And I think that lends itself more to fine art. Yeah, yeah. That and then sense. commercial work totally varies. You know, there's commercial, editorial, but generally for me, I draw a distinction. You know, I do commercial work, I do editorial work, but I do draw a distinction between that and my artwork. Yeah. Simply because, you know, my artwork, again, like I have pursued a path where I have creative control over the work I make, which means I have to hustle for the funding. But once I do that, I'm calling the shots. Mm -hmm. Whereas when I'm doing, you know, a commercial gig, I bring my style and my vision to it, but I do want to make my client happy, right? right? I'm being paid to do it. And that always changes the interaction. And my feeling, I, I mentioned this a little bit the other day, you know, my feeling is that students need to make fine art photography first. I, first. Really, I really think that's the foundation for everything else. Yep. Because you need to learn the tools of the camera and how those skills translate to certain, you know, how they result in an aesthetic and how that lends itself to communicating ideas yeah. and communicating your ideas. And then once you have that foundation and have figured out who you are as an artist, that's when I think you are best able to take on commercial gigs, which where you're sort of, you know, bringing your style to, you know, to meet someone else's agenda, which is yeah. always a tricky negotiation. And I don't mean that in like, it's a confrontation. It's, mm -mm. you know, I, I, I've always got on really well with the art directors I've worked with, but it is just different than when it's your ideas, yeah. your creative control. Like that's a big distinction. And I actually am a big believer that you kind of have to figure out who you are as an artist first Yes. Before you enter that negotiation, because otherwise it's really hard to hold your own. And also it's very hard then to like bring your style to a yep. shoot and stand by it in the way that helps you get more gigs. Which because, is something that, oh, sorry. No, no, just, I, I was just going to say that, you know, a lot of the time people hire you for like commercial and editorial work because they like your style. And for me, that's usually been, they like the style they see in my art portfolio. That's so how this I is where I can definitely tell the Zoom room, this is where I, you guys probably know that I, or maybe if you're watching this for the first time, before I went into academia, I was an art director in advertising. This is exactly what we are talking about is that when we, you know, once we were knew that we were going to like this campaign was going to go forward. OK, we need to do a photo shoot. Then next, especially if you were looking for a certain style, then you would find the style or the voice, as you said, developing, you know, from what that photographer had. It was if it was somebody who just knew how to work a camera, which is still a skill. The, I mean, you know, but I mean, most of the time we really wanted something about the way that person shot was something that we wanted. So then working at a large enough agency, then someone would go, it was usually a talent scout would go contact that person. If it was a smaller agency, I'd call them and the artist. And then when at the photo shoot, you know, an art director shows up with, here are the, you know, here are the really tight ideas that we have, you know, very much like this is what we're going for. Cause of course you don't want to waste time, but also 
there is an understanding. I hired this person because they're an expert and I want their voice to be part of it. So as an art director, then you're like, you just, you don't do a lot of directing. You just sit there and go, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then of course the photographer would come over and say like, is this what you're looking for? Is this what happens? Yes, you, you do that. And we have guidance, you provide it. But for the most part, you are not there to like micromanage the photographer. Believe me, you're paying enough for them. They better be good at what they do. <laughs> no, exactly. And like a lot of the time these days, well, I guess things have also, you know, changed in recent years. Like I've done a lot of shoots where the art director isn't there, you know, right. or it's remote and they're really not looking over my shoulder. They're just kind of trusting me yep. to make images in the style they want. Yep. They're not there to know what the images necessarily look like. You know, they just want me over the phone or over Zoom to reassure them that all's going to plan. I've got it. Yep. The work is going to, you know, be your subject with my style. Yep. And exactly, you guys, I'm, I'm, I mean, we're not, we're not trying to get into how much money is being made here, but we're just saying like, I don't know how much photographers, good photographers charge. They are worth it. They are so good at what they do that, I mean, that's why I hire them. So it is funny though. It did boggle my mind early on, like when I started getting commercial work through my art portfolio, because I honestly didn't anticipate that. Ooh. But that's like that that was how it worked for me. Like they Because you had a strong voice probably. It wasn't just look, I can vomit up all the other commercial stuff that everyone's doing, right? Like you had a voice. Do you think that's it? That for me, I think it started because people were drawn to my portrait work. Yeah. They told me that. Um, they, they were drawn to my approach to portrait work and wanted me to do that in their setting. And but yeah, I mean, pretty much any time I've gotten a really good commercial job, it has really been through my artwork, which I just, I didn't really think that was actually going to happen, but it does. <laughs> yeah, it does. But it really is like, they always want it to look like your work. Yeah. Yeah. That's why they hired you. That's your business card in a sense. Yep. And, you know, sometimes that can be challenging. And there have been times when I've been like, you know, I, I don't know if you know what you're asked. Like, <laughs> I'm not going to go there. Like, yeah. But I mean, the, you, you also like find the people that you like to work with and you might mm -hmm. establish really good working relationships and work for them repeatedly. You know, I, I've done a number of shoots for The New Yorker. I really enjoy working for them because they really... I mean, they really support me in how I work. They always want me to shoot large format. Very few places like pay for large format color film and processing these days. Um, but that's they're like, like, really supportive of the way I work because they know that's part of how they're going to get that look that they yeah. want. When you say large format, what size exactly is large? Um, so large format these days, it's either four by five inches or eight by 10 inches. I shoot okay. four by five. Eight by 10 is too expensive, too big. Gotcha. But yes, each negative is four by five inches. So that's a big negative with a lot of information. So you can make really big prints without any noticeable change in quality as you get bigger and bigger. And that was part of why I started doing it. Um, I was thinking about like making large scale prints for exhibition. And you can make a 3040 from a four by five negative and it looks like really oh yeah. Wow. Absolutely. I mean I, I did film work for for that half second when I was in photojournalism, but yeah, I've never it was just, you know, your little tiny camera. So that was wow. All right, I'm gonna look at my list of stuff here. Um let's see, what do you think is the well, I have so many questions to ask. What do you think is the importance of networking? Or one might, if people don't want to put that 90s edge on it, uh, community building. That's nicer. No, and that, wait. So what you just did there, that's what I had to do. In terms of like reframing what networking is. Yeah. Because I was deathly afraid of networking. 
Really? Definitely afraid of it. Like avoided it, which is funny because I'm a pretty social person, but like when it seemed like, oh, I have to like market myself. I have to sell myself professionally. It was like, I can't do that. I'm just me. Like I was paralyzed with fear at the concept of networking. And then I kind of got to a point, really, I guess my last year of graduate school, when I was like, I need to get over this because I need to have a career and networking Mm -hmm. is always a part of that. Mm -hmm. Um, And what I did is I just reframed it for myself. And I would literally tell myself before going to any event or conversation or conference, I would just say, okay, this is not networking. I am going to talk about pictures with other people that like pictures. Yep. That I can do. And once I took the pressure off and like reframed it that way, all of a sudden I had a lot of things to say because I love photography and I can talk about it. And all of a sudden the conversations were really enjoyable and then doors opened and it was like, oh, that wasn't as hard as I thought it would be. But all it is, is like me talking about the thing I love with other people who happen to share that interest. So when I thought about it that way, it's like, all right, I'm just, I'm not trying to impress anyone. Let's just talk about our shared passion. Yeah. And that for me, like- And being yourself and trying to, not trying to be this fake you. Exactly. You. Exactly. And then that worked for me. And I I do think it's really important because otherwise the work doesn't get seen. Mm -hmm. You have to put yourself out there, but it's not always as bad or scary as you would think. I actually really enjoy a lot of the conversations I have with like curators, editors, because now I just think about it differently. It's like, oh, okay, we're going to talk about the thing that makes me tick photography done yeah so I'm just like trying to think about you know like I I don't have a problem talking to museum curators or gallerists anymore because I'm just going to be me and I'm going to talk about what I love done then then your your name builds on itself and and your work is and Fletcher work is great so yes I I, I was like it networking was so oh my gosh it was such a thing but I, I do think it matters yeah. And actually, hopefully, Kinley, I hopefully that what she just answered kind of answers your question. How do you recommend finding opportunities to help grow your name in a professional setting? Or maybe it doesn't. How would you, I guess, part of what you said was talking at conferences. Um, that's a little bit more of an well, academic slash specialist. For you guys, that could be an AIGA conference. There you go. Join AIGA. That's right. Woo. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, how do you... I guess, yeah, answer, I guess your question, how do you recommend finding opportunities to help grow your name in a professional setting? So I, ha- I definitely have thoughts there. For me, it timing really mattered. I think I tried to put myself out there and didn't have success early on because I didn't have the body of work yet. And I felt kind of discouraged by that because it was like, how am I ever going to make it if I can't get anyone to answer my emails or look at my website or, you know, like, but for me, it really was after graduate school when I I really dove in and made a lot of work in graduate school. And once I had that body of work, then it was like, okay, now it's time to put it out. And once I had the work, that's when it's happened. And I, I, you know, in terms of finding opportunities to grow my name, It was a whole mix of things. Um, I did an unpaid internship, which I have mixed feelings about unpaid internships, but it ended up being one that like really helped me professionally because it was at a gallery. They gave me a solo show. Important collectors came to the show and bought my work and introduced me to other people. Um, I think also like, I wouldn't be afraid to cold email people I actually have a former student who has an amazing job as a studio manager in New York for a really prominent photographer right now. She just wrote an email out of the blue. Then they circled back to me asking for a letter of recommendation. And what they told me when they asked for that is we are impressed by the fact that she just emailed us out of the blue. 
that impresses us. You know, taking initiative, um, creating opportunities where there doesn't seem to be one. My first job out of college, yeah. I created that job. There was not a job. They asked for an art history intern. I was like, I guess I could do that. <laughs> I ended up being a photographic archivist for two years by convincing them not only did they need an intern for two months, they actually needed to make me a salaried employee for as long as I wanted to be there. Like, make opportunities, think big, but also like, don't be discouraged because there are going to be a lot of rejections. There's always more rejections than slam dunks. And that's just how it goes. But you have to pay attention to like, the conversations you value along the way. And I think conferences are important. You can do portfolio reviews. Portfolio reviews helped me a lot, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's as applicable to graphic design, but for photography, that it was is. really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, that was how I met my book editor, got the book deal. All of that happened at a portfolio review in like 24 hours. <laughs> that's by the way, you guys, everything that she just said, when you have professional practice with me, if you are a graphic design major, we will go over how to write emails after you brand yourself, yeah. how to talk to people, how to interview, how to, how to, okay, I don't, I guess yeah. schmooze is a, is a, makes it cheap and Yeah, but. And also another thing that is super helpful is to have like a visually engaging, like take home that's not necessarily a business card like a handout you know it's like I paid her to sell my professional practice <laughs> class I put you guys true, get that too. I used to try to sell a uh, um uh not a leave behind but a send before I can't think what it's called right now but it's how to try and get a job like the old school way with some paper and a cool thing to send and now we're just like yeah leave behind is the better thing to do not just a business card but something yeah. Something, something that'll catch them. Something that they'll yeah. be like, that's cool. I'm going to keep that on my desk or I'm going to remember and sometimes that. that really, really helps with the follow-up conversations because I think the thing that can be really discouraging is when people go to conferences or a portfolio review and they have a great positive interaction and then it doesn't lead to something. But I do think a leave behind helps, but also you have to follow up. Yes, you do. You have to you follow know? up. Without like pestering people, you have to write one professional email reminding them who you are and why they should care about your work. And another thing for the, when you take my class, you guys, you will make a job hunt journal for this very reason, because you have to keep track of all the people you meet and all the, com the times you have conversations yes. with them. But it's not like, a, oh, you have to. Once you start doing it, right, it just becomes second nature and like you're kind of gonna want to remember certain people's names the next time you see them anyway yeah. but then also your next body of work you know i've had conversations with curators where it's like okay you know what i'm currently working on not really of interest but it's like a positive interaction then in the future if i'm working on something that is a fit for them you reach out again you know and then yep. it's like oh wait okay now this is a fit yep <laughs> yes chloe's selling aiga hardcore i like it <laughs> yes <laughs> that's exactly it <laughs> she's even got her all caps on yelling at us okay. i know i got it <laughs> thank you chloe <laughs> but it's true it's true yes um but yeah that like like you said it's not just well, I talked to that person at the New Yorker. No, I talked to so-and-so at the New Yorker, or you probably have like five contacts, but then, because there are too many people, you just call up and go, can I talk to somebody in the creative department? Oh my God. Yeah. You're going to be on there. You're going to go straight to voicemail. No, you have to, you have to know names. And it also, this, this is kind of also just like, you know, being social, but like, if they tell you certain things throughout the conversation, it helps to like, Remember, ask Absolutely. about that, you know, like, how's that going? You know, like show interest in their work too, yes. you know, because a lot of art directors, editors, like these are creative people too. Yes. And if the more you really, respect really crazy what egos. they're yeah. doing, <laughs> like the more they're going to be interested in what you're doing. And it feels yes. like an exchange in a way that's like mutually supportive and, you know, just ends up feeling like a friendship.
Yes. It's a professional friendship, right? But right. it's still like, it can be a really nice, lovely interaction. Yep. But exactly. it helps you like listen to what they're saying to you also. <laughs> Which part of that is, I know that as you're, as for you students, as you're getting better, your nerves will calm down and you will start to listen. But in the meantime, always have a way to write stuff because, yeah. And if anything, you're writing and people realize that you're like, oh, they're paying attention to what I'm saying. Yes. So, mm hmm. All right. I would always so, like take notes after conferences and stuff like that. It's so helpful. Oh, yeah, definitely. Otherwise, in two seconds, I'll be like, oh, what's that squirrel yeah. over there? And I'll, yeah, mm hmm. Totally normal. Um, so, you, you, I saw you did a fellow fellowship for where we are. Was that a fellowship where you went somewhere and lived somewhere for the fellowship or was that a different kind of fellowship? Did you do? Oh, for the one in North Carolina. Yeah. No. So that, that was my first year teaching. I was teaching at Duke and I had a fellowship alongside that, um, to just photograph anywhere in the state of North Carolina while teaching at Duke. Gotcha. Which by the way, there is no just like that was still a really big deal that you got that just I'm just acknowledging your awesomeness. I was just wondering if it was a fellow because I know there are fellowships where you go live somewhere for, you know. Yeah, no, it was just like a stipend to make work anywhere in the state of North Carolina. And I and it was also like they also presented it as a commission to respond to a body of work from the 1970s. Um, yeah, and it was like one of the people I studied with, Alex Harris. Oh. Um, so it was really nice, like deeply considering his work and then articulating like my own 21st century response. Speaking of the 21st century, um, and from the very, very beginning, you talked about, um, oh, we also have to talk about photo books, but in just a second, um, <laughs> um, you didn't use the word advocacy, but you said justice or something like that at the very beginning, like, how do you use your style, your work to help certain causes? I guess you can say. You can totally get as political as you want on your yes, no, whatever, whatever. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And for me, it really varies by project. Um, the one we were just talking about in North Carolina, that was one where my photographs were used for advocacy because I was photographing migrant farm workers. Mm -hmm. um, and to get access, and also get a free translator. I went through a nonprofit and all my photographs they then used to advocate for better housing for seasonal migrant farm workers in North Carolina. So there, like they literally used it and that was the agreement. Like they helped me, I helped them. Yeah. Um, for the Tennessee work, that's a complicated one. I, I would not say my photographs have been used for advocacy, but I would say that they became the legacy of some people I really care about who are no longer on this earth. And that is a big deal for me. That yeah. makes that entire work and like several years worth it to me. Um, in Tennessee, I got really, really close with the people I was photographing. They kind of adopted me. Oh. <laughs> and um, you know, m many of them were up in years. Like the person I got closest to was in her nineties. Wow. Um, and I was making, you know, documentary film work and still photographs of her, like up until the day she died. And she told me her life story and was like, I trust you do with this what you will like, take care of it. She gave me all her handwritten song sheets from the 1940s, like her first Bible from 1944, like a lot of stuff. And for me, like there, it was about not advocacy, but like remembering someone in the ways they wanted to be remembered by getting to know them really well, thinking about how to present them as they wanted to be presented and like being really committed to that. That's why the book is dedicated to Evelyn, who actually, today's actually weird. I, to, she passed away five years ago today um, when she was 96 years old, but- Oh my gosh. I know, and oh my gosh, in the, we were really close. Like they listed me in the funeral pamphlet and obituary as one of her children left behind. Like she really adopted me and became- Oh my gosh. But I also like moved in with her for a time because, um, 
I needed to. <laughs> wow. So, so they're like, I, I think it's different in terms of like, you know, how my pictures can be used to help. But I do know that like the people in the photographs, for them, it was how they wanted to be remembered as musicians, mm -hmm. rather than the fact that, you know, they didn't have a lot of money, like grew up in the Great Depression, like lived in the Appalachian region, like they wanted to be remembered for their creative talents. Yeah. And for me, the best thing I could do in that setting was not like advocate for the fact that like, oh, they need help for this and that. It was more like, this is how they want to be remembered. This is how to dignify this person. That, first of all, that's beautiful. Uh, that also brings it me into, um, how do you, how do you make that relationship with, and you could use that as an example, I and mean, you kind of explained that, but just in general, when you are making your documentary work about when it's about people, which usually that's what the core of it is. So like, how do you get in there while still making sure that you are respectful, that you are going in there to tell the truth? That's okay. <laughs> My dog's barking too. I gotta go shut a door. I'll be right back. <laughs> Okay, I think I think the dog is taken care of now. Wow, um, that sounds like there was like a wolf or a dog. Yeah, you had a tack. Okay, my dog's just um, like, I'm outside. Okay, sorry, back to what we were talking about. <laughs> so in terms of getting to know people, again, that's been different on every project for me. Um, the Tennessee one was probably the most interesting. So you may not know this about me, but I ran a record label for a park ranger for a little while. And that was how I met the people in Tennessee. I represented them. Um, I was the assistant producer on their first music release ever when they were in their 90s. I was in, it was an AmeriCorps job. I love this, the last nine minutes of the I know, no, the, the whole Tennessee thing is like, um, I was supposed to go there for two months and like make photographs that would be used to promote these field recordings of musicians. And I fell in love with it there and really wanted to go back, which was why after I finished the academic year at Duke, the following year, I immediately went back and I never went back to Duke. Um, I took a job as an AmeriCorps service member, which part of why I moved in with Evelyn is housing was provided as a part of that. I was living in like this old FEMA trailer from Hurricane Katrina. And at a certain point, heat and water ended up not being a thing. So I moved in with Evelyn. But I was like essentially working as a producer at a field recordings music label, which was run through the state parks. The only park system in the world that has its own record label is Tennessee State Parks. Because in Tennessee, music is in the water. <laughs> Exactly. So I met the musicians because I was, you know, organizing their musical archives and oh. making pictures to help sell CDs in the park store. Okay, and for all of you in the Zoom room, are you as like, pick your jaw <laughs> off the table as I am right now? Like, what? Wow. It was pretty bizarre um, and pretty great. And I just, I got really attached to the musicians and I kind of kept going with it for several years. At a certain point, I did feel like I needed to not be living in that trailer and running the label. Yeah. Um, Cause you know, that ended up being like very much an office job and I wanted to make more work. And that's when I applied for a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. And that like funded the next round of my work which was really, really like, that was what I needed at the time. It was a huge help. Which by the way, for also all of you listening, she just happened to throw that in there when she got a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts, again. Grants are so important. But grants the fact that you so got important. it, like that was that's how, a big deal. Like, <laughs> grants are what has made my life as an artist possible. Really. Um, but I also encourage students, like in terms of thinking about grants, again, like think outside the box a little bit. The grant I got, it was not a photography grant. I don't think I would be able to get a photography grant. And they really don't give those out to individual artists. You have to go through a nonprofit. 
Yeah. The grant I got was for preserving traditional arts, documenting traditional musicians. I applied for a grant that worked for my subject matter. Fine art photography grants are incredibly competitive. Yeah. And they don't necessarily give you very much money until it's a Guggenheim. Yeah. Right? So you're like up against thousands of people for like a thousand dollars. Yeah. If you go through a nonprofit and also think about how not just to go through your medium, think about the subject matter, that can open up a lot of doors. And for me, that made the work feasible. Uh, I, I would never have been able to make the documentary films without that grant. I don't think I would have been able to publish the book. And I wouldn't have had those years with those people. Yes. Oh, and that's a kind of a thing where we are going to, we're not done yet, you guys. I'm just going to stop the recording and you can all turn on your cameras if you would like, but you can turn on your, let me stop the recording first. 